Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, Josh, good to see you. Thank you, Christian. You as well. And of course, with us, as always, is Jason Rugg. Hey there. And on top of that, we've got Brad or Bradley, depending on what you prefer. <laughs> Stare, our podcast producer. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Hello. I've never actually had a conversation with Brad before. So <laughs> I mean, like not like in this setting, you know, so right. he's usually he's hiding only, in the background. He's only been here, what, a month, a month and a half. Yeah, he's still new, <laughs> I know, but like him. And, and I think it's fun to have him on. So uh, we're uh, going to do something today where, you know, he's certainly as in the dark as just about everybody else. And so I figured, you know, you can ask some questions and maybe it's interesting to you. So here he is. Yeah. All right, Christian, before we dive into today's topic, what are some updates for the girl who wore freedom? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, so, you know, last week we talked a lot about film festivals and, you know, the process and what's going on with them. Uh, and I had said that we were in four film festivals upcoming. And uh, one of the wonderful things that we did this week is we changed our website around a little bit to make it easier for people to uh, engage with us on film festivals. So if you go to the girlywarfreedom.com slash festivals, uh, you'll see there are three watch now buttons. Um, this is to, as of today, it's March 3rd. Um, it's a Wednesday. And we, we have three festivals that we're playing in right now. Flathead Lake International Cinema Fest. They run through uh, Friday. Chagrin Doc Fest is going to have us all month of March. And then the Omaha Film Festival just started yesterday. And so they're a two-week festival. And all you have to do is click the Watch Now button and you'll be able to purchase a pass uh, from those different film festivals. All of them are nonprofit organizations. So the fee goes to those film festivals. And you can choose a you know, one-time festival pass for just our film, or you can purchase a little bit more and watch other films. At the Omaha Film Festival, a Q&A with me is included that I have to say was pretty interesting. So you might want to consider watching us through the um, Omaha Film Festival in, over the next two weeks, because uh, at the end of it, it's kind of tagged on is the, is the Q&A. So uh, that was the exciting thing that happened, as well as... We're going to Iowa. We got another exciting Iowa. Iowa, yes. where dreams are made in the field. <laughs> um, or where you can go to antique archaeology and see all the really cool stuff, uh, which is, you know, where American Pickers is based. So uh, it's a fun state. And we're headed there. We're headed to Dubuque. Iowa, and we will be there, uh, I think it's April 18th through the 25th, and this one is a live festival, so I'm super excited cool. for that. I thought that uh, our, like, times of live things was done, but we have it, uh, and apparently this is a really great festival. It's um, it's only six years old, so it's on the younger side, but uh, it's gotten great reviews as being one of the top cool film festivals, and it's got a lot of stuff going on. It's in a beautiful town right by the Mississippi River, so uh, I'm really looking forward to that, and if you're in Iowa, we'd love to see you. Another exciting uh, development is that I have a crew of reenactors that I work with in Iowa, headed up by a man named Dave Gordy, and if possible, if the film festival is going to let us, we have reenactors that would join us and bring some World War II vehicles and all sorts of really fun stuff to show people. So I'm hoping I can wow. convince the um, the festival uh, to add this option. I think that would be really fun. So uh, that has happened over the last week. And, um, you know, that's where we are film festival wise. Haven't won any awards yet, but really hoping for the best uh, with Omaha this week we should know in two weeks uh, and then we will find out the good news about Dubuque that I'm excited about if you are a finalist um, nominated for an award in your category if they have they tell you that you're one of the top three finalists in your category 
So if you are one of three finalists in the documentary category, they will pay for your transportation, pay for your lodging. And then if you win, it's a $4,000 prize. Whoa. That Whoa. was amazing. That, that would, would recoup amazing. your entry fee. That would certainly recoup my, <laughs> in, coop my entry fee. Yeah, so <laughs> I would be thrilled with that. I could really use that influx of cash right now. Um, and so that would be great. I would be able to share that with some of the people who helped create the film and uh, then pay some of our monthly bills. So that would be wonderful. Um, but I, I, I wonder how film festivals decide they're going to have a monetary prize. Cause it seems like most of them do not, at least in your experience. Yes. And for someone to say, Hey, let's, let's add on $4,000 to the prize, especially for, you know, a film festival that's not nationally recognized. You'd think we could use that money for something else in the film festival. Well, interestingly enough, how do film festivals make their money? Let's talk about that for one second. Um, Basically, there, there are several ways. Most of them that I've run into are nonprofit organizations to begin with, and they survive on donations of people in the community, individuals, uh, people that are film lovers, that uh, are patrons of the Film Fest. And then um, they do have entry fees for the filmmakers. And like I said last week, you can pay a single entry fee just to be considered for one category, or you can pay more money depending if you want to be considered for other categories. So there's that money. And then they, uh, of course, sell tickets to the film festival. So um, that that's their revenue streams, the most obvious revenue streams. Um, and then they will have sponsors, businesses will sponsor uh, and they will pay to advertise around the festival. And like at our last film festival at Buford, they had individual businesses sponsoring each category. So the Alpha Graphics in Buford sponsored the duty and honor category. And so they gave a certain amount of money that was, you know, above and beyond just a normal donation for a business. And that sort of highlighted their business. Um, so those are the revenue streams for a film festival um, in Chagrin. And that's the only one where I've won a monetary prize and I won $1,500 for the emerging filmmaker there. Um, that was sponsored by a, a finance company. So a finance company or a bank or something like that would donate that prize money to the festival you know, that would go towards that thing. So I don't know how, you know, the um, Dubuque Film Festival does it, but my guess is somebody is donating that money just for those prizes. Yeah, because I don't know. Makes sense. Yeah, I don't think they they break in a ton of money. You know, they're not doing this to make a profit. Um, they're doing it to provide a venue for filmmakers to give added value to the towns and to, you know, give some wonderful entertainment to film lovers in their area. So, yeah. So that would be super exciting if we um, won that award. We, I certainly like our chances based on, uh, based on, you know, the past performance. So we'll see. So uh, talking about this has reminded me of um, when I was in school, we had a, a really small film festival. I went to Aurora University, not a very big school, very tiny amount of people involved in the film program. And the professor who ran the the festival bought little trophies, you know, just like something you'd get by for like a little league sort of thing. But like it had a film reel on it and everything. And it had engraved on it different categories. But she didn't actually ask anyone who was going to submit what what they were going to submit so she had like best comedy best drama there were no dramas <laughs> and so like <laughs> she had to swap the categories last minute to actually you know give the awards out but then they were engraved wrong <laughs> yeah that, so, there are a lot of uh, mistakes that can be made like that in these film festivals for sure that's hilarious yeah there's a lot of logistics that go into it and that was just you know maybe 10 kids you know all entering their films so i can't even imagine the logistics of you know a, a national uh festival where you have hundreds of entrants yeah i can't either and you know we're, right now i've focused on the omaha film festival and they uh have i think 93 or 94 films that they're screening and this again is all virtual it's done through a platform called eventive and but I think only 25 of them are features. So 
each film festival does accept that I've been in anyway, a huge amount of shorts. And um, honestly, shorts are really popular at a film festival because they're short. And so you can, (laughs) because you can see a lot of them, you can feel like you're supporting independent film and seeing a lot of things, but you're not like all bought in because as you know, independent film can be really good and it can be really bad. And so, uh, you know, if it's a short, you're not sitting too much in misery. Um, So did I tell you? Yeah. Uh, Did I tell you about my film festival experience? Mm -mm. Do tell. When I went to college, I I was studying to be a speech pathologist, and I'm not one, as you know, but that was what I was pursuing. While I was there, I learned they had this editing machine, this editing bay that students could use for free, and I geeked out. So after my freshman year, I went home. I shot a film on VHS tapes, came back that fall, edited it, and it's a little children's adventure story about a kid who imagines – He's a little superhero and he fights the bad guys and all the characters are played by real people in his life. So it's just just a fun, cute kids film. And I just use all my cousins and kids in the neighborhood, things like that. That spring, they, my college had their first annual film festival. I thought, Oh, I'll enter this in there. And (laughs) there there were only four films and these were short films, uh, mine included. And mine stood out because it was a children's film. It was cute and fun. But the other three were definitely not children's films. Uh, Two of them were about sex. One of them was called Sex. And then the other one was some weirdo, trippy, not for kids movie. But mine really stood out. People loved it because it was so different. (laughs) The other three films. And we won an award by uh, the, the bad guy. Uh, sauerkraut. She won Best Actress. So oh, uh, my that's, cousin. Wow, that's super cool. Well, is that the cousin <laughs> yes. that is an actress? I know other side of the family. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, other side of the wow. family. Okay, cool. Well, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, that's a fun story. Yeah, shorts do really well at these film festivals. I've actually enjoyed them myself, and um you know, found a new love for these sort of shorts. I've learned, you can learn a lot in a really short period of time by watching shorts. <laughs> uh, so that was great. Uh, I would strongly suggest people go and look at the Omaha, well, any of these film festivals that are playing this week, Flathead Lake, uh, Omaha, or the Chagrin Dock Fest. Uh, there are some fabulous films out there. One that caught my eye that I can't wait to watch at the Omaha Film Festival is called Batman and Me. And it's about this guy that wasn't going to collect Batman figures, but he picked up one and then it kind (laughs) of got out of control. And so he just like has this world of Batman stuff that he can't, he knows it's an obsession and he needs to move on, but he can't even get rid of all the stuff that he has. He's so emotionally attached. And so I don't know what happens, but that's just sort of like the trailer part of it. So there's that. And then I also saw a trailer for a film at the Omaha Film Festival of this woman who was two and a half years old in uh, Poland when the Germans came in and they uh, initially took her and her family and all the other Jews in the area to watch a hanging of her friend's family. I mean, she's two and a half and she describes it in detail. They, um, you know, they did something, some minor infraction. I'm not really sure they wouldn't give up something or I don't remember the infraction, but it was a very minor infraction, but yet the entire family was hung, the adults and the children. And she stood there and watched that. And then later uh, she was taken captive with a whole bunch of other kids. And she was put in this, you know, dump truck in the back of the truck. She was in the corner, like right where the truck gate meets and the side of the truck and it had a little opening and she jumped out one night two and a half Hmm. and and she somehow survived and of course i haven't watched the film but but she survived and so at one point in the trailer she holds up a picture of all the kids she went to school with and um she and only one other person out of that entire group of school kids survived uh so that is a, as a documentary, I'm very interested in watching. And that's, that's kind of the thing that I've really enjoyed about these film festivals is just seeing these stories that I would probably never see otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, I'd highly recommend people, people go and watch. Um, so that's the film festival update this week. 
What is going on with distribution? You guys are, you got a deal, you're, you're making stuff happen. What, how's that playing yeah. out? People may have seen this episode is called Deliverables, and I purposely titled it that because we have been talking about for such a long time how we're working on these deliverables. So uh, I'd like to ask you, Bradley, you are new in our uh, podcasting world, and you're not a film producer. You do work in marketing and um but, but I mean, tell me a little bit about what you think I mean when I say deliverables. Okay. Well, I would assume that the first thing is obviously the film. That would be the major deliverable. Then you would need the artwork uh, for the film for either a DVD cover or just for the movie theaters or whoever. And uh, let's see, you probably need a trailer or two or three. Uh, I'm fading fast here. Okay. I had such momentum at first. <laughs> no, you, that was a great start. Let's see if your co-partners in podcasting can help you out. Uh, Josh, what do you think uh, I'm talking about when I say deliverables? Josh is shaking his head. Well, oh, whatever they ask you to do that they're not willing to do themselves, you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Josh, put a little bit more thought in than that. Oh, man. Uh, I didn't know I was getting quiz today. Well, they need, I'm gonna, I might repeat something that Brad said, but you know, they need images for marketing purposes. They need the trailer footage. They need a list probably of, well, do they need the Bible? Whatever that is, you know, that, that's got all like the, the stuff that says we're compliant. That's good. That's good. Oh yeah. The rights Bible. Rights Bible. Yeah. Boom. All right. Off to you, Jason. <laughs> yeah, Jason. Can you think of anything they haven't thought of yet? Well, then I think you'd probably need, there are different types of files of the video. You would need to have the version that can go into a theater. You could probably, you would probably need a version that is like the, un like not unedited, but the, the project file um, so that they can take it and make changes to it for, you know, Hey, we need to, you know, trim some out here or, or whatever. I would assume that they would probably want that ability, but I'm not sure. Um, and then probably all the audio stems, you would need all the audio separated out in its highest fidelity. Um, that's just more of the technical stuff I would assume. Yeah. So I saved you for last because I knew you would have the most insight into <laughs> Uh, to what this was because you're an editor and you work on Phil Vischer's projects and other projects. And so you have an awareness of a film and what it takes to like get it to market. Right. Um, and yes, you uh, you did have more than the other guys, but you're still missing a bunch. So uh, and and I didn't know this. So, of course, I've been going through this process and uh, and I just want to give a disclaimer here. This is only my process with my distribution company. And I am sure that it is different uh, depending on what distribution company you have a deal with. Um, and so I just want to kind of take you from the beginning uh, to where we are now. So when we signed the deal with our distributor, the document that they gave us was a contract that is spelled out uh, all the different um, things that we are giving them the right to. So our contract is a five-year contract. And it, and they have the right to operate on our behalf to license the film in, in just a long list of ways that I never even knew existed. And they usually sound like things like, you know, TVOD, SVOD, you know, um, AVOD, and there's, uh, you know, broadcast and there's, uh, you know, just all different sorts of options for distribution, airline distribution. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else is on there. We retained education. We retained theatrical. So um, if they had education and theatrical, there would be additional deliverables that we would need to give them. But because we carved those out, this list of deliverables that I'm about to talk to you about is just pertinent to, you know, streaming and broadcast uh, stuff. So when, the, when they gave us the contract, in the contract, the deliverables are spelled out. So they're part of the contract. You have to deliver all of this to us. And, um, and you know, 
if they have to do anything to fulfill, uh, help fill the deliverables, then uh, we, you know, they would charge us a fee for that. So they would take out money out of the fee if we had to ask them to do that. So it's in our interest to provide everything they need on our own so we don't have to pay for it out, you know, out of the returns that we would get. So our list of deliverables is culled from that agreement. Now, what my uh, distributor did is they sent me an email to begin with that said, here are three documents for you to start. And these are the initial requests that they wanted us to fill out. And it was a marketing sheet. So it was everything like um, all of our social media stuff, um, you know, what platforms we had, um, if, you know, there are people in our crew that had different handles, we had to include those. Um, and, you know, it, it, it asked for, um, you know, all of our website information. It asked about uh, for us to give them any press releases, media mentions, reviews from film critics, um, quotes from people, you know, authors, writers, whatever, and as well, quotes from within the movie. So we had to do a lot of pull quotes from the movie uh, that they could use in their marketing. So that was one of the initial requests. Another was... So when yeah. when you say pull quote, is that just written out? Is it actually a video clip? Like what what what's the actual deliverable with that? Yeah, with that, it's just text. So we okay. go back to the script. We would pull out, you know, most memorable lines, and then we would put that in those documents. Mm -hmm. uh, an another one was called a master list by title. And I don't really know what that means other than it asks questions like, you know, is it closed caption? Are there music are there music tracks? Uh, you know, have we delivered the master? Have we delivered the artwork? It's basically tracking, um, you know, the deliverables that we have given them. And then they asked for a sales sheet. And the sales sheet was the log line, the intro line, the short synopsis, full synopsis, the cast uh, in order of, you know, from top to bottom. Uh, the directors and all of the particulars, the genre, the runtime. Now, most people that are in film are very accustomed to that because that's usually what you have to fill out uh, with film festivals. And in a sense, some of these are not too dissimilar for the deliverables that you have to give a film festival because a film festival is a distribution agency. And so they're marketing on your behalf. They're showing the film on your behalf. And so it's very similar to a distribution company. Um, so those were the initial requests that we had to send them. And those were just documents that we filled out and we sent it in to the distributor. Any questions so far? No. So when you say, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Uh, when you say we, who's we? We would be me. <laughs> 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 um yeah mostly me yeah there uh so far all the stuff that you have heard about i've had to do now i think it's different on every project um in in normal people's project uh there are producers line producers uh you know there's all sorts of, there's unit production managers, there's first assistant directors, there's, you know, there's a long line of other people that are usually involved. In my project, I'm the producer, the director, the marketing person, the finance person. So usually, and, and it's my passion project. Nobody else is really getting paid to do all this work and it's a lot of work. So it falls on me. Um, now, that's not the case for everything. When we go on down the list of other deliverables, you'll see I have had to have some help, but so far all of that stuff has been me. Any other questions? Jason, you had one. So what is, if, if you knew all these deliverables at the beginning, what would you have done differently? <laughs> is there anything you would have totally changed how you approached it or uh, been prepared for? Yes. So the one thing I would do is um, what I really, really wish is that, you know how some people, I think I've talked about this before. There's the common core application for college students. 
I wish there was a template like that, that I had created that, uh, had all this stuff in a template that I have to use for film festivals. So, because oftentimes when I filled out stuff for film festivals, I had to do it all over from scratch every single time. And a lot of that was because they don't allow you to just plug in the information. If you do things on film freeway, it's already plugged in. But if you have to do an application for a film festival outside of film freeway, you have to do all the same information, but just line by line. And so many of them ask for different links of everything, different links for your log line, different links for your synopsis, different amount of characters that they want to know who's in the film. So I would have created some sort of metric. Um, and actually the publicist came along and helped me do that a little bit, but they came on really late and um, they were very good at wordsmithing and taking everything we'd already done and melting it down. Uh, you definitely need somebody like that on your team. So I would definitely do that differently. Um, but as we go down this list, there are other things I can tell you I would do differently as well. So Brad, any questions on your end yet so far? Uh, not just yet. Okay. So then the next thing that they did is they sent us a Dropbox link. And in the do Dropbox link, um, it had all of the folders titled with all the distribution deliverable, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know how you would call it. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just read these to you and then maybe that will, maybe you guys can come up with a word for it. So they sent me one big shared folder and inside that shared folder, there are smaller folders. So these are the smaller folders, additional art components, audio stems, closed captioning, completed initial requests that I've already talked about. ENO, which is errors and omissions, which is for the insurance. Um, a low res MP4 feature for review. Festival laurels, photos from the film, like sc screen grabs, the trailers, and the script and transcription. So those are the folders. And those are the main headings of the deliverables. Now, what is the additional art components? Well, Bradley, like you said, there are components for everything from our website to our clothing and merch in the shop to our posters and our postcards, our business cards, uh, you know, anything printed we put out, um, there are the actual images and then there are the project files that the graphic designer usually has. And so we had to give them all of those. Why? Because they are going to need to change them and tweak them based on their marketing and what their buyers are going to want. So they have to have control of all of that. Mm. So there's that. Audio stems. Now this gets into who are the people that helped me other than, you know, with the stuff that I couldn't do. And that would come down to the core creative team, which has been me, um, Jason Hoban, who did all of our sound stuff, Bill Ebel, who's the editor, and Jason, uh, Jeff Kurtnacker, who is um, the composer, as we all know. Uh, and then the graphic designer has had to upload stuff themselves, the graphic design team. So in audio stems, uh, those of you who don't know what audio stems are, and we will have Jason Hoban to, Hoban to come back on, and we're going to do a whole segment or two, maybe even three on sound because we've never fully talked to him. But uh, audio stems, in the audio process, Jason has said this before, there are different types of mixes. And a mix is where you take the dialogue, the sound effects, the uh, the interviews and the music, you put it all together and you make sure that everything is at balanced levels. Well, the mix is all of those things put together and you have a, we delivered a streaming mix, a broadcast mix and a, the, and a um, theater mix. So those are the three main mixes and the stems are the individual files in those mixes. Like I said before, the sound effects, the music, the, you know, dialogue, stuff like that. So the, um, so we had to up, Jason had to put all of those stems together and we had to upload that. 
So that's the audio stems. Closed captioning was one of the challenges that we have had this week. So closed captioning is different than subtitling, and it's it's a file um, that it goes alongside the film that then they input into whatever into you know the broadcast platform into the streaming platform so that you can click the closed caption button uh, and and not have to listen to it. One thing that we found in doing this, we tried to tailor the closed captions to look like our subtitles. So it was the same. And we discovered in this process that you cannot do that, at least as far as we can tell. Uh, closed captions are all these tiny little black boxes with white words, and there's no creative control over that. So the way that you, um, the easiest way that a lot of people get their closed captions is they put it through a company. So we used Rev, we put the video through there and we sent them the script and they created the closed captions for our film. And we got an SRT file back. Now in Rev, you can choose an SRT file, a .scc file, and there's one other one that I can't recall at the moment, but those files, um, different platforms ask for different kinds of files. So iTunes, for example, wants a .scc file. Another platform will take the .srt file. So we put our film through Rev. We, we asked for you know these different files, but then what we found out is for our film, since it's half in French and it does not translate French or transcribe French or anything like that, we then had to take that file and edit out over our French. They just put foreign language. Hmm. That was not very helpful because not <laughs> only did it not tell you what they said, but it also got in the way of our subtitles. So we then had to take that SRT text file and we had to cut that out and we had to, you know, fix all of these um, things so that it would be correct. And now you see in the English, the closed caption, and you see in the French, our subtitles that are already baked in. So we sent that to our distributor and they asked us for a .scc file, which we have discovered we are not able to create because um, we're working in Premiere. And when we put the, you know, let's say we ask Rev for a .scc file, they give it to us, we edit it, we go into Premiere and put it in there with our picture. Premiere does not allow you as we have, I mean, we've tried to find this before, maybe someone can tell us differently. We can only export an SRT file out of Premiere. So that's tripping us up in, as far as giving that deliverable. And then, um, so that's that's been a challenge for us. And now the, distributor is going to have to go to their post house and see if they can solve that problem because, you know, iTunes wants a .scc file. So that's been a challenge this week. Um, all right. Well, I know that Josh has a hard out coming up here soon. So I think we may have to take this conversation up next be, next week because we still have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different folders to go through. And uh, I have some stories about what else has happened. So uh, this week, there were some other issues that we ran into that uh, I knew, you know, I know we need to do differently next time. So I'm going to leave some time for questions. What do you guys, do you have any other questions? I mean, what, I how, uh, how much more intricate is the different mixes? I mean, I assume that the one for like the movie theaters are probably the most intricate because it probably has the best sound and you probably don't need that for streaming, I'm assuming. Yeah, it, they're, much... all, they're all very different. And we're going to have to bring Jason on to talk about that because I'm not an expert. Huh. I just know that the sound has been the biggest challenge for us. And I was super excited this week. I talked to Kate Hurley, who is a long time, excellent producer from Chicago. She used to work for uh, Evil Productions. She's just 
stellar. She's amazing. And uh, we are talking to her about coming on for our next project. And she watched this one and she was blown away by the sound. She just kept saying over and over again, how impressed she was with the quality of the sound. And that is all due to Jason. And he did the location sound and he did the post-production sound. And it was super challenging in our film, because I've said this before, we were not ever able to be in the same location, listening to the sound from the same speakers to give Jason any feedback. And so we've been constantly tweaking it as time goes along. Um, and the different mixes do sound different. And so Jason is the best person to speak about that. So we'll have him come back on for that. But you know what, you guys, he listens every week. So I just want to say, because he has to produce the podcast as well. Jason, you are a rock star. We love you. <laughs> we're so thankful for you. And we're happy that your work is being recognized. Can't wait to have you back on. Any other questions? Okay, quick update from uh, Josh. Uh, Josh, you did the movie proposal this week. It came out. We did episode 101 featuring Judas and the Black Messiah. We talked about all other kinds of movies in addition to that. It was, I, I think, a lot of fun. I actually got positive feedback from people right away who listened to it right away. I, I asked some people if I should, I stopped watching the film City of God. I was wondering, I was a little disturbed by some of the things happening in that film. I didn't know if I could continue it, but I got the green light. I should finish the film, so I'm going to. So thank you to any podcast listeners who are listening to this who encouraged me to move forward. So you uh, usually do the formula on there, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. What was the, uh, just tell me one of those, what was the borrow, uh, no, the old, what old films did you do? Donnie Brosco and the 1977 animated The Hobbit. Oh, mm, I, that's I've seen wow. that one. Interesting. Okay, <laughs> yeah. uh, great. So, Jason, what about you? Uh, actually, today, like half an hour before we started recording today, uh, we started releasing some animated shorts we made over the last year, uh, just on my Twitter. So, if you want to check out uh, some of the animation that um, my creative partner Sean and I have been doing, uh, go to my Twitter, which is at Jace Ruggy, or just look up uh, Jason Rugg on Twitter and you'll find um, some kind of funny little 2D animations about orcs arguing over um, whether eating man flesh is vegetarian or not. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I know that uh, people have raved about the, your humor on your Twitter, so I think they should probably follow you just for the fun <laughs> along with the animation. So Bradley, do you have an update for us this week? Uh, my biggest update is a personal update. Um, if anybody's ever heard me talk, you've probably heard me talk about the fact that my wife and I have been going through the process of an adoption. Um, it's been about a little over three years, I guess, in the process. And as of yesterday, we finalized our adoption. So we are finally through with the process and have a little girl that will be ours forever. So that is our big, big update for the day. Or for the week of lunch. I didn't, I didn't know we were competing with adoption stories, Christian. Yeah. You need to give us head to be like, what about the lame stories we had? <laughs> she set you up. She set you up. Yeah, that's why I went last. Ah, uh, that melts my heart. I'm so that's awesome. About that. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're so happy to have you on our team, Brad. Uh, you know, we just are really glad you're here. So, and you. I want to add that. I don't, I'm sure I am late to the party. I know inside information that you already know this, Josh, but I just started watching Ted Lasso. Oh my word. Can it's so I, good. Can I just tell you like, stop, go, do not walk, run and go watch Ted Lasso. It took me, uh, you know, to be fair, two or three, three really to get the buy-in uh because at first i just thought they were making fun of dumb southerners you know and that was what was going to be the storyline but the way that i would describe it so far is that it's if you ever saw the movie major league so it has the you know the essence of major league baked in there but with a really big heart and uh deep theology in my opinion uh Mm. And, you, and you don't have to like sports to love this show. You do not have to like right. the writing, the story building, the character development, uh, the acting. It, it's just top notch. So 
I highly recommend Ted Lasso. That's my Mm. two cents for the week. So anyway, I want to thank everybody for listening to our podcast. If you uh, have enjoyed this, uh, please let us know. We really would love to have some feedback from our audience as to the things that interest you are helpful to you. Uh, You can email me, Christian at normandystories.com, or you can tweet me. uh, I am Christian's Voice, uh, at Christian's Voice on Twitter. And you know, just let us know what you want to hear more of. If you're a filmmaker and you would like to talk to us about your film, uh, we'd love to talk to you and may have you come on our podcast. So, uh, you know, let us know. Let us hear from you. And I want to also say thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.